Our next presenter is Tony Roberts. Tony has been a Python developer in the industry for over 15 years, from a small hedge fund, from small hedge funds to the largest sell side organizations, and recently was a chief technology officer at a successful fintech startup. In 2010, he launched PyXLL, a Python XL add-in with tens of thousands of users in a wide variety of industries. In a previous life, he developed graphic engines for console games. Hi, I'm Tony Roberts, uh, and I'm the creator of Pixel, the Python add-in for Microsoft Excel. Uh, since about 2010, I've been helping large companies and individuals integrate their Python solutions into Excel. I started my career in finance uh, back in the early 2000s, uh, and what I learned very early on as a developer in finance working with the, the front office was that in that environment, Excel is king. Each time we would deploy some new feature or analysis tool uh, for the traders to, to use, their response was always, yeah, okay, cool, uh, but can I get this in Excel? Uh, in 2010, I launched Pixel, a native Excel add-in that bridges Python and Excel, allowing Python code developed externally from Excel to be used by Excel users in the same way as any other native Excel functions or add-ins. Very briefly, uh, this means that you can expose Python functions as UDFs, as macros, you can script Excel in the same way that you used to in VBA, you can create real-time data streams, you can create custom task panes, uh, you can have custom ribbons, you can really do everything that you can do through uh, Excel's add-in interfaces entirely with Python. Make sure you stick around for the end of this talk because I've got a surprise reveal right at the end. With Microsoft's recent announcement of their Python in Excel feature, uh, there's been a lot of renewed interest in using Python in Excel, and so a very natural question is, how does this new feature in Excel compare with the Pixel add-in, uh, which also integrates Python in Excel? So in this talk, uh, I'm going to demo both Pixel and Python in Excel in order to compare and contrast them. Uh, but to really answer the question of how are they different, we also need to understand who they're for. And to answer that question, we need to look at how organizations use Excel, and more specifically, uh, how people in their different roles use both Python and Excel to support the business reaching its objectives. I've worked for large enterprise investment firms and small boutique hedge funds, as well as working with hundreds of other financial services firms of varying sizes through my work at Pixel. Uh, and they all have more or less the same high level structure. My experience is mostly in finance, but I think broadly the same will apply to any data driven company. Uh, at the top, we have the decision maker. Now, this could be a portfolio manager in the case of a trading desk, uh, or it could be an executive in charge of a regional sales team. Uh, but what they have in common is that they're responsible for taking decisions in order to move the company towards their goals. Uh, and in order to make these decisions, they rely on insights derived from data. The decision maker depends on analysts to turn data into insights. These people are called different things in different companies and industries, uh, but their role is to support the decision maker. Sometimes the decision maker is also the analyst, uh, but in almost all cases, the insights and supporting data are provided in the form of Excel spreadsheets. Uh, sometimes they'll also use something like Power BI or another technology, uh, but even then in reality, a lot still happens in Excel at this stage. Next uh, are the developers. Smaller organizations might not have these and instead might rely solely on the analysts to do everything in Excel, uh, but usually companies beyond a certain size will have at least one development team. Development covers a huge variety of functions, uh, and usually when we talk about this group we focus on delivering product, uh, whatever that means for each individual company, uh, but their work somehow always feeds back to the decision makers, whether it's usage metrics for a SaaS product or trading activity details for a systematic trading strategy. Uh, in financial organizations, there's, there's another team, quants. Uh, the quants have a number of roles, but simplistically speaking, they're the ones that come up with the algorithms that model how the financial markets and instruments traded on those markets behave. Uh, they're sort of highly specialized developers, uh, but quantitative analysis is their key skill rather than software development. In other industries, this role could be a research scientist or another type of product specialist, uh, and sometimes quants and analysts are part of the same team, uh, or can even be the same person. There are, of course, many other different functions in an organization, uh, and the roles listed here have many different responsibilities, but in essence, they all contribute to this process of collecting data, then interpreting and analyzing that data to turn it into actionable insights that allow the decision makers to achieve the goals for the company. 
So you might be asking, what's, what's the point of all this? What does this have to do with Python and Excel? Well, what I wanted to do was look at really high level, like how Excel is used by different people in different roles uh, and identify how organizations I've worked with use Pixel to bridge Python and Excel. Uh, and then we can look at where the, the two different tools fit. So next, what I want to do is break down these roles that we've identified into levels of Excel and Python experience. Uh, I've split Python and Excel experience into casual and expert, uh, with those who are casual users of Excel and not Python experts on the bottom left, and those who are expert uh, Excel users and expert Python users on the top right. Uh, not everyone's going to fit this exactly, but as a broad generalization, I think it kind of holds up. So the decision maker generally will use spreadsheets developed by the analysts. They might be an Excel or Python expert as well, of course, uh, but they're really consumers of the Excel reports rather than the producer. Uh, they'll certainly know enough Excel to drill into some formulas and understand how a well-constructed workbook works, uh, but they're not going to be debugging VBA or Python code on, on a daily basis. The analyst role is to gather and analyze data to produce various reports that give the needed insights to base, base the decisions off. Uh, and they typically work almost exclusively in Excel and are real, you know, they're the real experts in using Excel. They might know a little bit of Python uh, or they might be interested in learning some Python, uh, but in this role, they're not, they're not the Python specialists. Uh, developers are different in that developers often dislike Excel. <laughs> they, they often tell me there's no need for Excel as everything is, is better written in code anyway uh, or in a Jupyter notebook. Uh, and they're, they're much more at home writing Python code than working in spreadsheets uh, and will often prefer to deliver data to analysts via auto-generated CSV files or in a shared database or, or that kind of thing. Now, uh, quants are different again in that like developers, they write code. Uh, but they also often work in Excel and they work alongside Excel users much more closely than developers often do. Uh, now, quants often build Excel add-ins for their Excel users. So they might write add-ins that expose models directly to Excel that users can then use in Excel. Uh, and the quants are really, you know, their expertise is, is quantitative finance. Uh, so although Python is probably the, the most widely used programming language among quants today, they don't have to be experts in Python, although of course many, many are. What we're starting to see from this is that there's often a split between Excel users on the business side, the decision makers and analysts, and then the Python developers and the quants. And it's this divide that Pixel solves by bridging these two worlds. What Pixel does is it allows Python developers to expose their Python tools to Excel users. These Python tools can be deployed to Excel users, even if the Excel users have you know, little or even no knowledge of Python. So uh, I've done a lot of talking already. Uh, so let me jump into a quick demo and show you very quickly how, how Pixel works. Okay, so I just wanna show you uh, a couple of things to begin with. And I've got some code that I wrote for this demo uh, in VS Code here. So just the important thing to note is that I'm just writing this in in VS Code the same way you'd write any other Python code. And I've got all the you know, tools associated with that, unit testing and debugging and version control, all of those kind of things. And then in Excel, I've got the pixel add-in loaded and the pixel add-in is configured to load these Python modules here. Now, using pixel, I can do all the kind of automation stuff that uh, you're used to doing in, in VBA. In fact, you have access to the full Excel object model through Python using Pixel. Uh, and I've got a function that demonstrates that here hooked up to a, an example ribbon button here. So when I click this, then we do some automation and you know it, it sets some stuff back in the workbook here. So that's really cool. So it means that you can actually develop apps in Excel and then have your Python code interact with the sheet uh, and kind of use, use Excel as your user interface to the Python code. Uh, another thing that a lot of people do is if they've got data held in uh, a separate service or a database or whatever it is, obviously you can access some data sources through uh, Power Query, uh, but sometimes if you're going to a REST API or you know some internal thing, it's kind of more convenient if you've got Python tools for accessing that data, just write some Python code to pull that data and then pull it into, into Excel. So here I've got a button which does exactly that. This just generates some random data, but it just loads it up sticks it in the sheet here. Uh, and then the final thing I want to show you here is 
I've added uh, a button, but not just to the ribbon, to the context menu here. Uh, so here I've got a button saying plot call Python chart. With this data selected, I can select that. That then runs the Python code and plots a cool Python chart. Uh, and this is kind of nice because this is like uh, through through this you've got access to obviously to Seaborn, which you've probably been seeing a lot about on LinkedIn recently, but also Matplotlib and Plotly and Boca and basically all of the Python plotting libraries are available through Pixel. Uh, so you can kind of use this to build build up nice dashboards. And again, just using Excel as your front end uh, for this kind of thing. So the the point is that your end users don't necessarily need to be writing Python code, but you give them this toolkit of stuff which uh, brings your Python analytics and toolkits and stuff into Excel for them to use. When we're talking about toolkits of functions in Excel, uh, what we're often talking about are worksheet functions or UDFs, you know, the functions that you call directly from the Excel worksheet or from the function wizard, and that's something that Pixel excels at. So let me show you that now. Uh, in this same file that I was looking at earlier, uh, down the bottom here, I've got a couple of functions. Uh, so these are uh, this is a formula that's quite well known in finance called the Black-Scholes uh, formula, and it's used for, for option valuation. But here I've got two functions, BS call and BS put. They're for two slightly different variants on options, but it's not too important uh, for this. What I want to show you is that to get these functions uh, that you know that I've written in Python into Excel, so someone can use them, all I have to do is add the Excel func decorator. So this Excel func decorator is imported from the pixel package and I just apply it to the function like that and now save the file uh, and now all I need to do in Excel is tell the pixel add-in to reload this module and I do that by clicking the reload button here. That's now reloaded the module uh, and these Python functions will now appear in Excel. So if I do bs call you can see that function is available uh, and also kind of nicely, it's got the, I added this documentation to the function here to say, you know, what the function does and what each parameter is. Uh, and that has come through into, uh, into Excel as well. So, you know, a user can very easily start using this function and understand what it does. So if I just put some values in the sheet, show you this. So the first value is the strike price, is the stock price, then a strike price, then time to expiry, risk-free rate, and volatility. And to call this function, just like any other, you know, regular Excel worksheet function or UDF, pass in the arguments, calls the Python code, and then I get the result here. So, you know, nice and easy and super fast. So let's just do a couple more of those. Let's just uh, do some different strike prices. Uh, let's just do that. And then drop this down. And I could do the same for that BS put call as well. And you know you can see now how I could very quickly provide an Excel user with a toolkit of like high-level mathematical functions, and they would then be able to use that directly from uh, from Excel in this way. And as I go in and change things, so if I here I was going to change the time to expiry. Uh, as I change that, then the dependent cells update because these are just Excel functions as we're used to. You know they they live in the Excel dependency graph, and as things change, just the ones that need to be updated. Are updated. Now with, with Pixel, the worksheet functions aren't limited to just you know scalar primitive types like this, uh, individual numbers and stuff like that. Uh, we can pass Python objects around uh, and we can also use pandas data frames. If you've been following the Python in Excel news, you will have come across pandas data frames already, but essentially they're like a, a tabular structure in Python for representing tables of data. Pixel has support for that as well as other data frame libraries like Polars uh, and in you know, all kinds of other Python types. Uh, what I've got here is another Python function which generates a Python data frame similar to what we saw in the first thing I showed you with the automation but written as a, a worksheet function. So this function here, cluster data, takes two parameters, a number of samples and a number of components and I'll show you what that does now. So let's put this down here. So n components, uh, n samples rather. We'll do 10,000 to begin with. And then n, uh, let's just pick five. And if I call this function cluster data with these two inputs, then we get this data frame returned 
as a, a dynamic array in Excel like this. Now we've got this data, we can pass it into another uh, worksheet function as a range, uh, and I've got another function here which actually just produces that the same plot that we saw before. So this takes the data frame, a uh, number of clusters, and a title. So let's give it a title k means, and for the number of clusters, this should be end clusters here. Let's just make that equal to that. And if I call this function, what we should see, pass this in here, and pass in clusters and title. So we get this plot, uh, you know, just below the output of this function here, and uh, and it looks similar to what we did before, but it's now it's using a function rather than uh, a macro. And what that means is as we change things, so let's change this to 10 clusters, regenerates the data and replots the result, all very, very quickly and all kind of, you know, seamlessly integrated into Excel. Now, if I change the inputs for any of these, we'll see, you know, the, the plot updates. So if I change the title uh, something else, then the plot instantly updates with the updated title. Uh, if I was to change the number of samples to, let's say, 50,000, then very quickly, instantly updates, returns the new data frame, and replots this thing here. Uh, so it's all like pretty, pretty seamless, really. One thing I want to show you around this stuff is even if you had a function which took you know a few seconds to complete, changing other inputs on the sheet doesn't affect these because it's using Excel's existing dependency graph. If I go and change things like this here, these update, but Excel knows that these other things don't depend on those numbers, uh, so there's no need for them to update as well. So it means that your spreadsheet like stays really, really fast, which is really important in a lot of environments where uh, if you were to give you know, a trader, for example, a spreadsheet, which every time they change an input, they had to wait 10 minutes for, you know, for the result to change, uh, they'd very quickly tell you that that wasn't good enough. So I've spent quite a bit of time now talking about uh, how this works from an Excel user's perspective, uh, and hopefully you're starting to see you know, that, that thing that I was showing you at the beginning with the different user types, how the Python developers can use Pixel to wrap their Python functionality and bring it into Excel so that Excel users just use Excel in exactly the same way they used to, uh, but with these like super powerful Python functions running sort of behind the scenes. Uh, I want to switch quickly and just talk about the developer experience because you know if, if this stuff is super complicated and the developer you know if it's, it's slowing down their development they're not going to want to use it so the developer experience is is just as important really uh, i've been showing you the code that i've been writing in vs code uh, so because this is just normal vs code and the code is is saved to the file system i can check it into git or whatever version control system i'm using i can use uh, continuous integration i can write unit tests all that kind of stuff all of this happens outside of excel so this doesn't really change my normal development process and all of the controls and checks around that are, are still the same so that's really great from a development point of view uh, but from a tools point of view as well one important part of the development cycle is is unfortunately debugging <laughs> And uh, VS Code has a built-in Python debugger, and we can use that with Pixel and Excel. If you're using a different Python IDE as well, you can also use those. It's kind of, it's, it's really down to you. I just happen to be using VS Code. So for example, this BS call function, uh, you know, let's say something was going wrong here. I could obviously add print statements that get written to the log file and all this kind of stuff. Uh, but what I can also do is just set a breakpoint and then connect this VS Code to this Excel uh, and step through and see what's going on. So to do that, I just do run and debug. Uh, and then I'm using this attach to process feature of the Python debugger, attach to Excel. That just takes a couple of seconds to connect to the, to the Excel process. There we go, it's done it now. Uh, and now when I call this BS call function, or when Excel calls it, uh, what we'll see if I just change one of these is Rather than updating here, it drops into the debugger. Here I can see my local variables. I can hover over things and see numbers. So S was what I just changed to 99, so I can see that's been updated. Uh, and I have all the you know normal features of the, the debugger because it is just the normal debugger. Uh, I can step over stuff, see how the program's doing, uh, resume when I'm ready, and then 
see the result back in Excel. Uh, and once I finish debugging, I can I can just detach. Uh, so that means it, from a developer's point of view, it's a really nice experience because they're using the same tools that they always use. Their development process is the same. It's just Pixels providing that, that bridge between that world and Excel, uh, but also giving them a way to kind of develop stuff in, a, in an efficient way, giving them access to the tools that they already use, like the, the debugger that we just saw. A lot of people also use uh, Jupyter Notebooks to develop code. Uh, and this is another like, really nice point from a developer point of view, is that with Pixel, you can just start a Jupyter Notebook from inside of Excel. So here I've got you know, Jupyter actually running in a custom task pane as part of, as part of Excel. Uh, actually, custom task panes are a feature of Pixel that lets you use any of the Python uh, user interface toolkits to build these kind of rich user interfaces or user forms. Uh, but this is kind of an example of one built on that technology that embeds the Jupyter Notebook into Excel. So I can uh, have a, a notebook here, and I can just run code yeah, as I would normally from a notebook. And this is great for just testing out snippets of code, seeing what works, building functions before you know, copying and pasting them into uh, an actual project in VS Code that can then be checked in and be subject to all the normal controls and deployed to your end users and that kind of stuff. But for playing around like this is, from a developer's point of view, this is, this is really, really nice. And for analysts and people like that who want to dip their toe in and, and write like bits of ad hoc code, uh, Jupyter Notebooks are really, really great. So from here, I can do things like uh, I could say Excel get. This gets the current selection into a data frame. Uh, I can do all kinds of stuff. I could say get this into a data frame, and I could say df dot plot. So you know, do uh, I mean that's not a very interesting plot here, but I could change it to say x equals x y. Oops. Excuse me. Uh, this kind of stuff. So while I, especially while I'm learning uh, all these different APIs, all of these things, being able to use this and being able to like interact with Excel is is really really nice. Uh, I can also do things like let me just get rid of some of this. If I was writing like a UDF, like we just saw, like these BS call, uh, BS call and BS put, I can do that from the notebook as well. I can say from pixel func. Uh, let's just create one called. Uh, let's just do this. Why not? And add the Excel func decorator. And immediately that function is available for me to call uh, from Excel. So it's kind of just really nice being able to iterate really quickly. Uh, and from a developer's point of view, or from not just a developer, but anyone who's like writing Python code uh, in this context, being able to do it in this way is, is really, really fast and provides a really, really nice kind of development experience. Now I want to just highlight one thing at this point, which is all the code that we've looked at so far lives kind of outside of Excel. With Pixel, what you're doing is letting uh, Python code be developed outside of Excel, but then having this bridge so that you can then call it from inside of Excel. Even with these Jupyter Notebooks that we just saw, these notebook files actually still just live on the file system like Jupyter normally does. Uh, they could be alongside the Excel workbook, but they're always like separate. And the reason for that is like, I'm a really strong advocate of keeping your code and your uh, Excel workbooks separate. Uh, and for organizations that care about you know, consistency, this is, this is a really key point. Imagine if you had two traders sitting next to each other on the desk. If they've got two slightly different models, they're asking the models the same question, but getting slightly different results. Uh, that's, in most situations, not acceptable. And so having your code separate means that you're just referencing that same code and everyone, no matter you know, where they are, as long as that same code is being deployed to them consistently, get, this, get access to the same models in the same way. Even if you're uh, working on your own and you just have some Python analytics that you've built, but you have multiple spreadsheets that rely on those analytics, uh, you want to know that each time you start a new workbook, you've got those functions accessible to you. If later on you find a bug, you go and fix it or you add new ones. Uh, rather than going through each workbook and making those changes kind of painstakingly, by referencing that same code across everything, you know that everything's consistent. I remember uh, shortly after I first started in finance, like maybe six months or so after I started, 
one of the traders came over to me and said, oh, he was having this problem with this, this workbook and the, the person that normally looks after it, one of the other traders was, was out on his annual leave. And uh, so I had a look and it was this, you know, you can imagine the, the sort of thing, just like loads and loads of VBA. Uh, and I didn't have a clue what I was looking at really. And eventually I figured out what the problem was and it was the VBA that had been built over years and years. Uh, but so I found the problem and fixed it and he was happy, went away, I was like, yeah, this is brilliant. And then literally less than 10 minutes later, one of the other traders from the same desk came over to me and said, oh, I heard you just you know, fixed the spreadsheet for so-and-so, mine's having the same problem. And <laughs> what had happened was this spreadsheet had just been copied from trader to trader. And they all ended up with essentially what was a very similar workbook, but all slightly different because they're all doing like slightly different things with it, had different, uh, you know, sets of, of tickers and what, what have you. Uh, so it wasn't a question of just being able to say, okay, here's a new copy of the spreadsheet, now you can all use this. I had to go around every single trader that was having this problem or using this uh, and updating theirs individually. It wasn't refactored into uh, a VBA add-in, it was just VBA code in the workbook, uh, as, you know, as is quite normal. Uh, and this is a huge problem for organizations because you end up with these, these little errors or these little differences kind of propagating as code gets copied and pasted uh, to different workbooks and then sent around. And so you may have one person that notices uh, a bug or a problem, it might be VBA code that they've originally written, they can fix it in their workbook, but they've got no way of knowing where these, where these errors have propagated to. And so for organizations where this kind of consistency really matters, and I think really that's all organizations, having the code cleanly separated from Excel is really, really important. That's why with VBA, you know, we have VBA add-ins. You don't have to write VBA in the workbook. You can write a VBA add-in and then everyone can reference that same add-in. Uh, so Pixel takes that same approach where your Python code is always separate and your Excel workbook is then just importing and using that Python code. Of course, there's, there's nothing to stop you embedding Python code in the worksheet with Pixel. You can easily write Python functions that you know, fetch that and then and execute it. That's no problem. You could you know, even save in the custom XML parts or wherever you want. Uh, but you know, I'd, I'd really seriously think carefully before doing something like that. Okay, so now you know a little bit about how Pixel works and some of its basic features. Uh, I want to go on and look at how that relates to what we were talking about earlier uh, and some of the different ways people use Python and Excel in, in their different roles. Uh, we saw before that there was this divide between Python developers and Excel users, and hopefully now you have a good idea of how Pixel can bridge that divide uh, in a way that's intuitive and easy to use for both Excel users and Python developers. Uh, and it's not just Python experts. Anyone with some basic Python skills can use Pixel. Uh, I always recommend learning some Python first though, because once you know the basics of, of Python, it's then much easier to apply that using Pixel. One common question that comes up when people first start looking at Pixel uh, is, doesn't everyone who uses this have to have Python installed? Well, uh, Python does get run locally. Uh, it's part of the Excel process using Pixel. So the Python runtime needs to be available. Uh, but that's not quite the same as saying that it needs to be, you know, quote, installed. Uh, Python, Pixel, and your Python code can all be packaged and deployed very, very easily uh, without the end user needing to actually run an installer. And Pixel even has tools to facilitate auto-updating so that everyone is always in sync. Now we've looked at that, let's move on to Microsoft's new Python in Excel feature, uh, and we'll look at how that works in comparison to Pixel. The first big difference to understand is that with this new Python in Excel feature, everything runs in Azure. Uh, this means if you're completely new to Python and you don't already have Python installed, then you don't need to install anything new to get started as everything is already there for you in the cloud. As you progress and learn Python, uh, you'll probably eventually want to install Python locally to get the most out of it. Uh, but at least initially, while you're trying out Python for the first time, uh, this saves you that extra effort. With Python in Excel, uh, instead of writing functions and macros in Python that then get exposed to Excel, the Python code gets entered directly into cells using a new PY function. Uh, when the workbook's calculated, all of the code in the Python cells gets uploaded to Azure and then runs in the cloud. And then when the results are ready, they appear back in Excel. 
So let me show you that uh, by entering some very simple code to begin with. Create a new sheet and then enter this new equals py function. And then that turns this cell into a Python cell. And I can type Python code in here. So, uh, so I don't know, let's just say uh, x equals hello. And then I'll finish the cell with x here. And what we'll see is that x value is the value that we see in, uh, in Excel. Then I do uh, control enter to enter that cell. It runs the code and then I see the, the value coming back to Excel like this. Now, for someone with a casual interest in Python, uh, this is great because it lets you just, you know, write some Python code here and see the results straight away. Let me show you this with uh, some of the code that I was using earlier. So let's take uh, this function here to create some clustered random data. Uh, and I just copy this into a new Python cell here. So we say equals py. And I need to unindent it here. And then I'll say df equals this, and then df is the last thing here. Uh, here we had a, a couple of variables passed in, so I'll just set those here. Oops. And this here. And now when I enter this cell, that then runs in the cloud. Oh, I need to do an import. And we get back this data frame uh, as a cell in Excel here. What I can do now is change the output type of this cell and say Excel value. And now we get that data frame uh, returned directly into Excel, kind of in exactly the same way as we did with the pixel one, wherever that's gone. Uh, but rather than as a user defined function, now we've got that with the Python code in Excel like this. Normally with Excel formulas and functions, uh, we're used to referencing other, other cells in the sheet. Uh, and that's what we want to do here as well with the end samples and end components. Uh, we can do that in Python rather than have them hard coded here. We can pull out values from, uh, from the sheet. So I'll just make a bit of space to do that and I'll show you. Now, rather than pass these in as arguments, uh, what I do in the Python code is reference them using this Python function Excel. And now Python in Excel will read these values. And when it sends the code off to Azure, it will also take that data uh, and run the function. So when I do control enter, we'll see that returns the results. And as I change this, this updates correctly. There's another important difference between normal Excel functions and these new Python cells. Uh, Excel builds a dependency graph between cells so that it knows uh, what cells need to be recalculated and in what order they need to be recalculated. Uh, with these new Python cells, that works slightly differently. When you're running Python code in these cells, it all happens kind of in one big global namespace. Uh, so for example, here where I've set this variable x, I can actually reference that from another cell. So if I go here, for example, make a Python cell and just say, you know, x, uh, I can reference this variable that was set in this cell from this cell here. Similarly here, I've got this df, and I can reference that uh, just like that. So what I can do is actually pass data between cells, between these Python cells, but kind of behind the scenes without it really being uh, you know, obvious from, from the normal Excel user's point of view. So that the code can run predictably, uh, the Python cells are evaluated in this strict left to right and top to bottom order. Uh, you can still see what inputs a cell has using trace precedence like normal cells, uh, but since you're allowed to use global variables in this way to effectively pass data from one cell to another, uh, Excel can't, can't use this dependency graph in the same way uh, to know like that if one cell's changed, then it only needs to recalculate you know, part of the graph. So it always recalculates all of the Python cells from left to right and top to bottom. Uh, this is a big difference from how Excel users are used to seeing uh, Excel work. Uh, and if you use a lot of Python cells, this can get quite slow quite quickly. 
The recalculation ordering is a really important thing to remember when using Python in Excel, as now simply moving one cell to another has the potential to introduce bugs into your workbook. Uh, if you're creating workbooks for other people to use, uh, they'll need to be extremely careful when making changes, as even changes that previously would have been considered sort of formatting or design changes can now actually affect how the calculations work in Excel. If I quickly copy this, this data frame that I created with the Python code before, I'll just put it over here. What we'll see is when this comes back, even though these are completely independent, if I change one of them, both of them recalculate. So that's what I was talking about when I meant, you know, if you have a lot of these things, it gets quite slow quite quickly. Where people are going to really benefit from using this is where they need to use like just little bits of Python in order to do advanced uh, analytics and things like that that aren't so easy to do just in plain Excel or using uh, VBA. But they don't want the overhead of you know having uh, Python installed and they don't want to be like writing Python packages. They just want to be able to write a little snippet like this. Um, but they don't really you know, care about reusability or kind of reliability of the spreadsheets. And they're not, you know, they're just a, an individual contributor who's trying to get some results. Uh, they're not trying to build a spreadsheet that, that anyone else will use. And one of, the, one of the nice things that you can do with this stuff is be able to use the Python plotting libraries uh, in Excel, kind of like we saw with Pixel as well, but again, just being able to enter the plotting code directly into Excel and see the results straight away. So if I take, uh, again, the same code that we saw before uh, from, from Pixel, and rather than just enter it into a cell directly, I want to show you another thing, which is, which is kind of neat, uh, which is the new Python editor. Uh, that's a separate add-in. So if you go to the uh, developer tab and then add-ins, find the Excel Labs add-in and add that and open it. Uh, and one of the new features in that is this Python editor. This is kind of like uh, a sort of cut down Jupyter notebook, I suppose. Uh, and you'll see all of your Python cells kind of listed sequentially. So in the same order that they run, uh, but listed top to bottom here. Uh, so this is kind of nice because it gives us a, a better editor than the formula bar that we were using before. So what I can do with this is uh, I'll take the same plotting code that I used before and then create a new Python cell, copy and paste this code. Uh, this plot here was the pixel function to get the plot into Excel, so we don't need that. The uh, df here that we pass in as an argument to the pixel function is now already defined uh, in this cell. And the and clusters equals Excel. That's this one. Oh. oh, this is still kind of in beta, so I guess there's there's a few quirks to iron out. Uh, and the title is K okay, means. So I can run this now. Oh, I need a couple of imports as well. So I can run this, and then this comes back as this image. Uh, and again, I can change the type to bring it into an Excel value, which then brings it back as this like picture in a cell. Now I can either do something like I could uh, merge this cell to make this you know one large cell with a larger plot, uh, or I can right click and say on the picture and cell options, there's a create reference thing here where I can uh, input it here. So this is kind of like a nice way of uh, pulling in this Python plot into Excel with a bit of Python code written directly in the sheet. This stuff, uh, this only supports uh, matplotlib and, uh, and Seaborn at the moment, but that's, that's enough to get you started with most of the sort of Python visualizations. For things like uh, Plotly and Boker, you can, you can do that with Pixel, and I'm sure that will come to, to Python in Excel at some point. Uh, one other weird thing that I don't really like so much about this is when you scale it, it becomes clear that it's just a bitmap. Uh, so, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't really, it sort of warps and when you scale it too much, it gets quite pixely. Uh, so that's kind of a, a different behavior to, you know, with Pixel where when you do rescale it, then 
pixel does rescale the, the image kind of properly. Uh, but that's a very, very small detail. Uh, and I think for a lot of people, you know, being able to use these advanced Python plots in uh, in Excel is going to be it's going to be really good. I know uh, Carlos is speaking uh, directly after me on uh, using Python plots in Excel, so he's going to have some really really cool use cases for you to see, uh, which I think is is going to be really interesting. So uh, overall, I think the the Python in Excel stuff is is really really good fun, and I think a lot of people are going to really enjoy uh, you know this first introduction to Python using this stuff and the immediacy of being able to just enter some code and see the results in Excel. I think is is really cool. Uh, I think as you learn more Python and you want to kind of expand your knowledge, uh, you may find that some of the limitations uh, you know, mean that you want to look for, for alternatives, but you know that there are other alternatives out there. And for more sort of complex use cases where maybe you want to deploy code to a, a team of people or you want to prepare reports which are going to be used repeatedly, again, like I would just warn you some of the you know the things that I've noticed about embedding code in workbooks and and you know, what I would consider best practices around that. Uh, also, if you're looking to provide sort of user interfaces to other users, uh, or do things like you've probably done in the past in VBA, like doing the automation, things like that. Uh, at the moment, the Python and Excel stuff is just writing Python code in cells like we've seen here and getting the results, which you know is great for, for a lot of use cases. But if you do want to go onto the automation side of things and building user interfaces and, and all that kind of stuff, uh, then again, this, this isn't going to do that right now. Things like you know, writing this sort of stuff or doing uh, you know, the, the ribbon things and, and what have you. But anyway, like I say, uh, I think this is going to be, for a lot of people, a really, really good first step in, in their kind of Python journey. Going back to our typical organization, now we've had a look at both Pixel and Python in Excel. Uh, I think it's kind of clear that the person who's going to benefit most from this new Python in Excel feature uh, is the analyst with an interest in Python. Developers and quants in their role are much more likely to be building Excel add-ins for their users to use, uh, and for them, Pixel is a much more obvious choice. For businesses as a whole, uh, and some of the things the decision maker is going to care about, are going to be uh, the speed of development and iteration, like how long does it take to get something usable into the hands of a user, and how long does it take from getting user feedback to making changes. The ease of use by end users, so you know, is the, is the application, Excel in this instance, usable by everyone who needs it? Uh, can an end user tailor it to fit their needs, or does every small change require more development effort? Uh, and is it fast enough? Uh, if a spreadsheet takes hours to recalculate, it's, it's no good. The consistency of results, can results be reproduced and verified? Uh, can other users access the same uh, underlying calculations? Uh, and how can we ensure that everyone is accessing the same underlying code? And finally, maintenance. So if the author of a spreadsheet leaves, can someone else pick it up? Uh, if there are bugs or problems, like how can those be tracked to ensure that the fix is applied everywhere consistently? And how can the code be tested prior to deployment? These things can be summarized uh, as, as essentially two axes, coding best practices and time to delivery. Developers uh, can build Excel tools in .NET or C++ or Java using tools like XLL+, Excel DNA, or Jinx. Uh, and there they have the advantages of best, best practices like version control and code reviews and all of that kind of stuff that comes with a, a professional development cycle. Uh, but these languages are often slower to develop than Python. With VBA, uh, it's possible to build quickly. But as long as that code's saved in the workbook, there's always going to be challenges around code consistency, maintenance, and testing. Using the new Python in Excel, uh, we get really fast development time because of the immediacy of writing Python code directly in Excel. Uh, but all of the same problems associated with code saved in the workbook, as well as some new challenges around performance and recalculation ordering. Pixel is much more closely related to the C++, C Sharp, and Java add-ins, uh, and offers all the same benefits around code quality and consistency, uh, but it also offers the development speed of Python, even letting code development take place directly in Excel in a Jupyter Notebook. At the beginning of this presentation, I promised you a reveal, and I want to share with you now uh, a sneak preview of a video that I'm working on. Now, this is all built using Pixel, entirely in Python, uh, so check it out and see what you think.
If you'd like to try out Pixel for yourself, then please do. Uh, just go to the website pixel.com, that's P-Y-X-L-L. Uh, on here you'll find loads of details, but there's this big, you know, try Pixel for free button, so just click that. That'll take you through to this user guide. You need to have Python installed, but once you've got Python installed, you can then just run pip install pixel, like any other Python package, and then run pixel install, and that's what installs the, uh, the actual Excel add-in. Uh, and that's, that's all there is to it, really, but you can find full instructions here, and there's loads of videos to help you get started and all that kind of thing. There's also uh, support, so you've got full documentation, videos, FAQ, and a form to contact us if there's any additional help that you need. Whether you came to this presentation excited to learn about Python and Excel and knew nothing about Pixel, uh, or if you've already used Pixel and wanted to learn about the differences between Pixel and Python in Excel, uh, I hope I've given you a good overview of the different functions the two tools have. Uh, I don't really think it's so much a case of one versus the other. It's more about understanding what you want to get from combining Python and Excel, uh, and then determining what's going to be the right tool for you. If you've never written a line of Python before, then I really hope that Python and Excel gives you that motivation and the tools to start. Uh, it's a great language and I, I really think you're going to enjoy it. If you've got any questions at all about anything I've covered today or, or anything else, uh, please feel free to get in touch. I'd love to hear from you. Uh, you can email me or send me a message on LinkedIn, uh, or there's a contact form on the pixel, pyxll.com website. Uh, there's also a YouTube channel for you to like and subscribe. Uh, and if you've enjoyed this talk, there's an evaluation form you can complete. Uh, if you haven't enjoyed it, then I'm sorry about that, and you can just ignore this slide. Uh, and finally, Microsoft is looking for some research participants, so if that's something you're interested in, then please do reach out to them about that. Thanks again for being here, uh, and I hope to see you at another event soon. So thank you, Tony, for that great presentation. I really appreciate you uh, joining us again for yet another iteration of Excel Virtually Global. Thanks. Yeah, great to be here. So we've got several questions, but I've, I've just got one question that I want to ask first, um, using uh, using my moderator queue to jump jump the queue quickly. <laughs> um, how did you feel when uh, Microsoft announced that they were going to sort of bring in Python and Excel? Because obviously that has uh, pretty wide ramifications for Pixel. Yeah, uh, thanks for asking. Uh, so I actually, I kind of knew it was coming for a few years, so it wasn't a complete shock. Uh, but I think what was interesting was when I first tried it out, and I was really surprised at how different it was from Pixel. And uh, I, guess, I suppose it was a relief in a, in a way, because they could have just done something which was a Pixel clone, uh, which would have knocked me out of the water. But what they choose, chose to do was something you know, very, very different in the way that it's all cloud-based. And as I said in the presentation about how code has to be saved in the workbook. And for me, I was kind of like, whoa, like none of my clients would want to use this. Uh, there's lots of other people that would want to use it, don't get me wrong, but the kind of for the, the problems that Pixel addresses, I spoke to a lot of my clients about this. They were very clear that like, yeah, this isn't something which they would be able to use for those specific problems. So it really is addressing a very different segment in the market to what Pixel is. Uh, so you know, that, that was a relief. <laughs> Fair enough, okay. So going to the questions that we had coming through, and we had uh, about five of them, I think. So, um, first one was, do we need an internet connection for Python to work in Excel? And this came in when you were talking about Pixel, so I'm assuming you can try and answer in the context of Pixel. Sure, yeah, so no, you don't need an internet connection to use Pixel. Uh, obviously, Microsoft's Python and Excel is different. You do for that because it talks to Azure. But if you're using Pixel, then no, you can run everything absolutely locally with no internet connection. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, second question was, can Python create an Excel add-in like VBA? Yeah, so that's exactly what Pixel's doing essentially. So Pixel is the, the thing that lets you uh, create that add-in uh, where you know Pixel is being that, that bridge. So Pixel presents itself to Excel as a, a fully native XLL and Excel add-in, uh, which is then importing your Python code and exposing that Python code using Excel's add-in interface. Cool, all right. Question three, if we send a workbook uh, to someone who doesn't have this Python function, mm. uh, can they see the chart? Yeah, so what will happen is they will see the uh, any charts that have been created because those, you know, those images are in the workbook and also any uh, calculated results are also saved in the workbook, so they'll see those. 
what will happen though if they try and recalculate the whole thing is they'll get a whole load of name errors because those functions don't exist for them and this is actually it's it's uh, in some ways it's a benefit <laughs> because for a lot of companies their you know their source code is is their secret source so they don't really want that source code going out being sent out to anyone they and they spend a lot of effort putting controls in place so they don't leak their source code uh, so for a lot of, in a lot of cases that is the desired effect where you don't want your source code to go out of the door very fair okay um this is possibly kind of linked is um py in uh in the new python and excel a volatile function so in, in terms of speed do you think pi or vba is faster so the the new py function is it's like a sort of pseudo volatile function in a way because as i showed in the video you have these global variables that sort of propagate throughout the entire sheet excel no longer knows like what the dependencies for these cells are so uh they're not volatile in the true sense that when you recalculate uh you know they always recalculate but if anything involving any kind of python stuff like any input to any python cell has changed then all of the python cells will recalculate and that's kind of you know, if, you, if you're just playing around with one or two functions, then maybe that's fine. But if you try and do anything more serious, then it's kind of a disaster. And again, like this is obviously in beta and everything. So, you know, we, we assume it's going to get better. Uh, but if you look on YouTube, if you just search for how fast is Python in Excel, I do some comparisons showing uh, Python in Excel versus uh, Pixel. Uh, and that's like to me, I was, I was really, really surprised how different they are in terms of performance. When you compare against VBA, it's different because I never like to say that Python's faster than VBA or VBA is faster than Python, because you can write really, really slow Python code and you can write really, really slow VBA code. But if you're writing Python code, taking advantage of a lot of the libraries like scikit-learn and uh, NumPy and Pandas and those things, you know, what I would say is it's possible to write very, very fast Python code and also uh, to, to solve a lot of problems, which would be not impossible, but very, very hard in VBA. Uh, so there's definitely advantages to using Python. Pretty fair. Um, and speaking of those variables, the very last question that we have that came through the Q&A was if we have duplicated variable names in multiple cells that use the Pi function, uh, when we call it in another cell, what's it going to return? Yeah, thanks for that. That's a really, really good question. And it's it's funny, uh, when, when people are sort of taught programming, you're often taught don't use global variables because they're evil and all of this kind of stuff. And what the py function and python and excel does is essentially make all of your variables global so if you have like we saw in my presentation if you say like df equals this over here and then somewhere else you say df equals this over here or if you just copy and paste some code from someone else's workbook that has, happens to have in the middle of it x equals something if you then run some code here which relies on one of those variables like who knows which version of it you're going to get i mean it is like you you can figure it out but just by looking at the workbook, it's very, very hard to know whether you're getting a global variable set here or if you're getting a global variable set here. You delete one cell because you don't need it and then something else changes. So it's, it's uh, yeah, it's like, I, I think that's going to be a, a big source for a lot, of, uh, a lot of Excel spreadsheet issues. Fair enough. Well, that's it from the questions here. Um, any last words you want to tell to our viewers? No, I mean, just just thanks again for having me on. And yeah, I really enjoy being part of it again. So thanks for, for hosting the event. It's our pleasure. Thank you for being here. Um, and just in case anyone uh, didn't see it before, um, just popping the feedback link up onto the screen now. Um, <clears throat> so do provide us feedback. You can scan the QR code or head down to the link bit.ly slash EVG in capital letters 2023 feedback.